Good morning. Goedemorgen. Joshi Dele. Thank you, everyone. It's wonderful to be here and privileged to welcome you all to this very special event. I'm Sering Chamba, Executive Director of International Campaign for Tibet in Europe. It is truly <coughs> an honor for me to making this very brief introduction today. How deeply fortunate we are here in this room, in this lifetime, to be in the presence of one of the greatest world leaders of our time, I'm going to be His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama. Political questions okay. about the evolution of things, ICT, okay. where it came from, okay. in about inside of Tibet, so that people understand what's happening okay. there. Okay. Your Holiness, we are profoundly grateful to your leadership, your wisdom, your compassion, and for your vision of a world in which conflict is resolved through dialogue, where religious harmony replaces religious strife, and where the oneness of humanity is respected. It is needed more than ever in a world driven by conflict and tyranny. Our nonviolent part is not a passive process. It requires courage. Your Holiness, it requires us to follow your example. At the International Campaign for Tibet, this is our guiding light. ACT was founded to fulfill your vision, and this year we commemorate 30th anniversary for serving Tibetan people <clears throat> and your holiness. <clears throat> the ACT community, now worldwide over 100,000 strong, connect caring individuals who act for Tibet and peace and justice across the world. Starting from Washington in with one office in 1988, under your inspiration and your guidance, your holiness, Today, we have offices in Amsterdam, Berlin, Brussels, and staff in London and in Dharamsala. As the largest Tibet support group, we are working to keep the Tibet issue alive on the world stage to support Your Holiness's efforts for a negotiated solution for Tibetan people. We are active at the United Nations directly challenging China's attempts to block support for Tibet. We work in Tibet, we work in the European Union, which you have always admired as a symbol of peace and unity. We work at the highest levels, from the White House to foreign <coughs> ministries across Europe. We engage our supporters, ensuring the voices of Tibetan people inside a herd. RCT campaign for the release of political prisoners, knowing the importance of solidarity and compassion for those who can feel most isolated. We have helped to secure humanitarian assistance for refugees and development program for Tibetans inside and outside Tibet. We work with the younger generation of Tibetans, training and mentoring the future leaders of Tibet. We brief journalists worldwide, and our reports and research have helped to shine a spotlight on the appalling situation inside Tibet. In Tibet, China has instituted increasingly hardline policies that underline, undermine Tibetan culture and religion. There's a deep climate of fear, with even very young children being indoctrinated in Chinese Communist Party propaganda. Since 2009, more than 140 Tibetans have set fire to themselves and act 
emerging from the anguish of oppression. But even so, during all these years, the Tibetan people's spirit is not crushed. In particular, the young generation is continuing the challenge to the misguided policies of the Chinese government. We at International Campaign for Tibet are determined to meet the new challenges we face in serving Tibetan people and your holiness. We must find new ways to tell Tibet's story. A concerted effort inside and outside Tibet is needed now for a lasting solution for Tibet. We must build stronger international support for Tibet with like-minded countries across the world, with institutions, but also with individuals working all together towards this common goal. Let us rejoice in your holiness's presence and rededicate ourselves, knowing as the Indian political leader Jaya Prakash Nayan said many years ago, I quote, is Tibet lost forever? No, a thousand times no. <clears throat> Tibet will not die because there is no death for the human spirit. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of International Campaign for Tibet to wish your holiness a long life and may all your aspirations be fulfilled. Thank you. Thank you. Dear friends, now I have the privilege and honor to invite His Holiness Dalai Lama and Richard Gere, Chairman of International Campaign for Tibet, to start a 25 minute conversation. His Holiness and Richard know each other very well and have developed over the past decades a very special friendship relationship. They meet as often as they can, whether in the United States, here in Europe, or in India where Richard attends his own his talks and teachings. Despite their different lives and backgrounds, both of them share a lot of common values and ideas and have very complementary understanding of the world. I'm sure that you will notice this, this very strong intellectual and human connections between them. Richard does not need a long introduction, as you, I'm sure you know, his incredible commitment to support Tibetan people for many decades. As a Buddhist and a close friend of His Holiness, Richard has played a very unique role to promote peace, justice, dialogue, to resolve the issue of Tibet, which unfortunately very far from being resolved. For me as a Tibetan, it has always been an honor and inspiring to see his life commitment have chosen on the side of truth and justice. And I hope that you will also feel inspired and enjoy their conversation as we at the International Campaign for Tibet, we do every time we listen to them. Thank you, Your Holiness. I guess um, I guess I'm running with it. Does it sound okay? Can you hear me? First of all, welcome everyone. I mean, this is an extraordinary group here. So I really had no idea how many people would be here and what extraordinary energy <laughs> was here. And uh, I think it, one factor, today, Sunday, 
even even so no work nobody <laughs> i think they sacrifice <laughs> sleep <laughs> okay we we try to make these later in the day but it costs more later in the day so we have to do them in the morning that's <laughs> um you know whenever i see a group like this i'm i'm always there's a a a poem by a, a japanese poet uh, Kobayashi Isa, a very simple poem that under cherry trees there are no strangers. And I always have that feeling around His Holiness is that He is our great cherry tree and that sometimes half a million people, strangers, in normal life come to see His Holiness. But under the cherry tree of His Holiness, we all become friends very quickly. Uh, he has that in unique ability to find that common denominator of life force, joy, love that animates us. Um, and I've never failed to see that happen anywhere in the world, whether it's been in, in India, of course, where literally half a million people will show up in Bogaya or Siliguri or Ladakh or wherever and immediately we're all in a very small close family friendship or if it's in America or in Europe, South America and Mexico I've seen incredible things there with His Holiness um, I'm here today uh, as the chairman of the International Campaign for Tibet so I, I think the talk we'll have this morning which will be about 25 minutes will focus on the situation and has it's evolved uh, since the 50s and the present. And I'd, I'd love to have His Holiness share with us his view of how this, the, the situation has evolved, how it's changed, and eventually the, the situation as it is now in China and also in Tibet and how it relates to that, that dynamic as well as the international dynamic. I think if we have time, I'd like to get into also his Holiness's feelings about this rather crude form of nationalism which we're seeing evolve around the world now. It's very unpleasant and crude nationalism, tribalism. Uh, so we'll see how far we get in this talk. We have about 25 minutes. So Your Holiness, just to start with the evolution of the International Campaign for Tibet, this, to the best of my knowledge, it came from three people originally, Lodi Gary Rinpoche and uh, 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 Van Walt was, I think, was in that first mm -hmm. group too, and Michelle mm -hmm. Bohana mm -hmm. came to you with an idea, probably in around 1988. And from my own side, we had just started, Bob Thurman and I had just started Tibet House, and I was becoming much more politicized at that time. But do you remember what your vision was or your hopes and dreams for ICT and the international political movement to help the Tibetan people? Of course, very important because I think as far as six million Tibetan people's determination is concerned, very strong. But we need support from outside world so therefore, uh, this organization, see, I think right from the beginning, very, very active. Firstly, I think, uh, I feel it is very important, Tibetan struggle, not just political. We, I think now more and more people, including many scientists, uh, you see, realize the knowledge which we kept over a thousand years originally come from India. This knowledge, sometimes I describing those knowledge which come from originally come from India, mainly in Nalanda tradition. Uh, over a thousand years, we kept, now today, these traditions available only in Tibetan tradition. So that, uh, besides 
sort of Buddhist practice or Buddhist thing, right? but psychology and philosophy, like quantum physics, and then logical approach. These things I consider, I think, the treasure of the world, I think. So therefore, uh, Tibetan issue, very much to do with that. If Tibetan issue is just political, then I will not uh, already now, uh, I think some of them may know. 2001, I retired uh, from political responsibility. Uh, the old political sort of matter was carried by elected political leadership. So I retired. But as far as the responsibility for preservation of Tibetan Buddhist culture, this ancient Nalinda tradition, I really feel something really worthwhile yeah. to preserve. And there is real potential to share uh, more human beings. So I think the, uh, my very concept, the sense of responsibility or global responsibility, is actually come from, you see, the Buddhist tradition. Mm -hmm. We always say entire sentient being as a mother sentient being. So, so this uh, organization, as I, ICT, uh, very very helpful. You see, uh, make clear about Tibetan issue. So it is very, very useful. Thank you, and including you yourself. Hmm? Right from the beginning, uh, you really, I think, fully involved by yourself. So I really appreciate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I remember being in Bodh Gaya in 86, I think it was. He's holding his side. Uh, I, I met him in, in Dharamsala in 1982. And um, I had been a student of Zen at that time, uh, Japanese Buddhism. And uh, it completely captured me. And I had a, a, a daily Buddhist practice, which uh, was a wonderful thing to establish. Uh, but when I met His Holiness and the Tibetan community in Dharamsala, my life radically changed, obviously. And uh, I, I saw the fullness of the possibilities of, of taking the teachings of the Buddha very seriously in, in the 360 degrees of what his teaching was, and that the ability to completely transform one's mind and one's life uh, was, it was, we were capable of that kind of incredible and complete transformation. So it set, certainly set me on a path. But when we met, I remember very clearly in 1986, and I was on my way leaving Bodh Gaya, and I, I was brought to your rooms, and you said to me at that point, you know, we need a lot of help, us Tibetans, and we need to rely on our friendships in the rest of the world. And I think it was in those years where you realized that the, the Tibetan dilemma, the paradigm, had to be internationalized to really help the people inside of Tibet, that it couldn't be kept as a small dialogue within Asia, that it had to be internationalized. And that really was the root of the, the impulse to create uh, International Campaign for Tibet, which uh, Siring Jampa has just said, we have offices all over the world now, and I think are doing extraordinary work. Your Holiness, could you talk to us? There's so little that we know about what's going on inside of Tibet, and the lives of Tibetans inside of Tibet, and how that has evolved. When you left in 1959, Obviously, there was chaos. Uh, no one knew exactly what was going to happen at that point. And could you describe a little bit about your thinking as you left Tibet in 1959 and went into exile in India, what you saw as the future 
of Tibetans in exile, but also the ones who had to remain inside of Tibet. <coughs> Last six years, the situation sometimes very serious, and including torture, killing, uh, very, very serious, but sometimes a little bit comparatively more lenient. Uh, for example, during Cultural Revolution, or just before Cultural Revolution, uh, around 56, the open revolt started from Eastern Tibet. Come, Lisan. Then that, also the crisis spread uh, on the area, Northeast Tibet. 1958. So a lot of people killed. Many people, you know, arrest. So I think early 80, my, so my so it was a direct contract with the Chinese government. As a result, you see, we have the opportunity to send some fact-finding mission. So, after they return, they told me some of their own sort of the, uh, village, the male, uh, male, uh, male population, uh, male population uh, much reduced because of killing, fighting. So, very sad. But uh, uh, then, uh, the after the Cultural Revolution, uh, particularly when Hu Yampang became party secretary, then things really much change. So then after Hu uh, Yampang, <coughs> in China proper, Eventually, Tangemin event happened. So then, <coughs> their policy become more hardliner. So in Tibetan area also, then uh, some of these hardliner they are very short-sighted, narrow-minded. So they, in their eye, separate Tibetan identity, including language and religious Buddhist knowledge, they consider threat, source of threat of separation. So accordingly, they really carry systematic policy. Uh, in many areas, they restricted restriction study Tibetan. And then these bigger monastery, you see, they start political education. So, very difficult. But then, more suppressive policy, Tibetan become more harder, including younger generation. So then, uh, Jiang, during Jiang Zemin, Marie, Jiang Zemin, President, then we develop some direct contact. And comparatively, things a little better. So like that, sometimes, see, because of that, uh, uh, much difficult, sometimes a little bit better. But the economy is concerned. Now, in many Tibetan area, new buildings, new house, and uh, also the, I think, economy facility, I think, uh, improve. That also good. Now my main concern is the environment issue. One, my Chinese friend, uh, ecologist, he wrote article, uh, mentioned the global warming from 
effect from Tibetan plateau to global warming as much as South Pole and North Pole. So he described Tibetan plateau is third pole. So we really need a special sort of holistic care about environment. Uh, and some Indian uh, ecologists, they say Tibet high altitude and dry climate once damage the ecology, the, it take longer for revival, recovery, recovery by nature. Therefore, uh, it is very important to take special care. I usually say telling my Indian friend, we are supplier of water to millions of Indian, whole northern India, and also China also, like Yellow River, and then Mekong River, also through Vietnam. Uh, and then some river which uh, go to India. All these ultimate source is Tibet. So taking care. Uh, now already there are signs the snowfall reduce. And even Dharamsala, 1960, summer, I come to Dharamsala, as the government of India arranged. Uh, that winter, a lot of snowfall. Then each year, less, less, less. Now these days, uh, during winter, snowfall in my place, uh, very, was very less, except in uh, high mountains. So there's clear sign of global warming. You should know that, that Dharamsala is, in the winter, is one of the coldest places on the planet. <laughs> and also the rainfall. Hmm? The precipitation right? in Dharamsala is, is off the scale. But it has radically changed in the last 10 years, 15 years. Right, right. So after I retirement from political responsibility, thank you, uh, But I fully committed regarding uh, Tibetan Kazajuti, ecology, environment issue. And then most important is preservation of Tibetan knowledge, as I mentioned earlier. Oh, something. I really feel yeah, very useful. But this is I, something I, I have your no holiness. modern education, nothing. Uh, but when we meet uh, scientists and many scholars, the ancient knowledge which come from India, I study from childhood. When I study, I was very, very lazy student. I have no interest this subject. But gradually I realize all the knowledge which I learned from childhood oh, really, really useful. <laughs> oh. So, my translator, he, ex-monk, so he also find this very useful, this knowledge uh, they learn in, in big monastic institution. So, I really sort of I said, fully committed to preservation of this knowledge. And now, fortunately, now China become, I think, the biggest number of Buddhist population, around 400 million Buddhists. And many of these Buddhists really showing genuine respect and the genuine interest about uh, Tibetan Buddhist tradition, which they realize pure tradition, authentic tradition of Nalanda. So some Chinese scholar, they describe Tibetan Nalanda tradition, Buddhism, Buddhist, Buddhist, Buddhism is very scientific sort of religion. You want to explain a little to this group Nalanda? 
with that tradition. I, I think you explained better. <laughs> well, His Holiness has been talking about Nalanda for, for many decades now as really the source of, of Buddhism, and that's where all the great scholars were. It was the greatest university of its time, 8th century, 9th century, 10th century. Uh, the greatest minds of, of Asia came to uh, Nalanda to study, and it was a vast university, uh, walled city university. And one of the interesting things about it, it, it had gates at the cardinal points, and they put their best debaters, their greatest minds, in each of those gates, and you had to win a debate with one of those debaters, those great minds, to be allowed admission into Nalanda. It was really an extraordinary, visionary place of, of, of learning, of, of excellence on all, all levels. But that's the tradition that His Holiness really speaks about and, and, and he teaches. So, the, like Nagarjuna and Arya Sangha uh, and so on, these great master. Uh, they are writing. We still use as a textbook. We study. Uh, firstly, these root text, learn by heart, memorize. Then each word, explain. By teacher, uh, according commentary, mainly wrote by Indian knowledge master, mm -hmm. masters. Then also the Tibetan master. I think that book which translated from uh, India, mainly Sanskrit, and then Pali, uh, to all together th about 300 volumes. Sometimes I usually see telling people when I give some sort of lecture on Tibetan, we should not consider these 300 books something sacred book and uh, not only as an object of worship. Oh, these are the texts. We should study these books. So, so these uh, among the about 200, uh, 25 or something volume wrote by Nalanda masters. Really excellent. So in Tibet tradition, is some monastery, not much study. They carry some rituals. I openly telling them, these are outdated. If you simply carry ritual like that, uh, that uh, unfortunately become keeping blind faith. No. Now reasoning, reasoning, debate. Very important. So, about now more than I think 40 years, uh, I appeal all Tibetan monastic in, monast monasteries should start, even those who say traditionally not studying these books, should start study. So they, most of them listen to that. And then nunneries, nuns also. Is he should study equal way. So now, two years ago, about 20, that's a nuns, Kishi, Kishima. That's the highest academic degree in the Tibetan tradition. Uh, so, uh, then, now really, uh, one good news, uh, the whole Himalaya, Himalayan, the Buddhist population. You see, they set up one committee. You see, their goal is try to each monastery in Himalayan range should be learning center. Wonderful. Wonderful. So therefore, uh, now these things, whether you are believer or non-believer, I believe different religion, okay, that's personal matter. But as far as knowledge, psychology and uh, like quantum physics. Now this, just knowledge. Now these days I'm telling, you see people, in our modern education, 
the education about hygiene of physical there now should include hygiene of emotion that's very important i think we will uh, passing through some kind of crisis of emotion that basically we human being according scientist compassionate human nature more compassionate logically we are social element we all received maximum affection love from our mother without that we can't survive and then constant anger fear eating our immune system whereas we see keep more warm heartedness uh, very useful uh, for our health so these are the reason basic human nature is more compassionate therefore uh, if now the problem is existing our education so called modern education uh, only oriented about material value not be i think at all rare uh, attention about our inner value no oh. so so i uh, the tibetan issue from that aspect i feel very important well absolutely we're we're all beneficiaries of the tibetan diaspora in many ways the tragedy that has befallen tibetans in tibet has forced these extraordinary beings into the rest of the world and have brought their ideas to us and the ideas that are coming into education for sure i know there's pilot programs around the world that are using a lot of tibetan techniques of of emotional transformation um and working with the mind uh but also in the realm of of science and physics and and your holiness would you speak to that some of how this has evolved this dialogue between you and science western science and how i mean i've been part of this also in in obviously tupten jimpa is is the chairman of mind and life mm-hmm. uh the two of you have seen this evolution of of eastern practices eastern science eastern exploration uh, and how it's interacting with western ideas and approach to the ideas of consciousness consciousness reality emotions etc speak to that a little bit about the how that's evolved and where we are now i think you should speak ka <laughs> huh i know you participate mention you 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 should let me, let me let me set the stage for this because this started mind and life started in 1982 was it dialogue was 87 yeah it was about that and it was a, a, a these dialogues and interactions that take place in dharamsala at his holiness's residence and it started as maybe four or five six days of talks with world class scientists in in different areas of of uh, behavioral sciences physics etc and it was essentially for his holiness to interact with these ideas at a high level but they would always evolve into something more than anyone ever realized as these ideas would would clash initially but then they would find a way to get larger and more inclusive and now these these dialogues are happening all over the world and has become part of the the norm of science dialogue now in a quite extraordinary way when it had been marginalized and really was peripheral um and his holiness has been in the center of that in his ability to to uh move from a completely eastern point of view of exploration in terms of consciousness and mind to a western idea as well i'm curious and we don't have that much more time but the sticking block between eastern sciences and western sciences is can there be consciousness outside of the brain outside of material reality and this is always comes to this point with you and scientists where you agree to disagree but how do you think that we'll ever be able to bridge that distance 
uh, and our sort of contact or discussion with scientists, mainly four fields, cosmology. The essential sort of concept uh, already mentioned some Buddhist text. Mm. All galaxies is to come from five elements, then dissolve into the space, come and go, come to go. So it's already mentioned. But more detail, like Big Bang, uh, we can learn from scientists. Then uh, neurobiology, uh, Tibetan medical system, more knowledge about a physical condition. Uh, although in our practice, there's a certain yoga practice, uh, also you see mentioned about the different element of the body and the different sort of, or say, channels like that. Uh, then, kasa, physics, uh, quantum physics. Quantum physics is concerned. Uh, I have keen interest, uh, so I have some discussions with uh, sci many scientists about quantum physics. Where we discuss uh, one here, one ancient, one sort of Indian nuclear physicist. Now he no longer. He once told me, uh, quantum physics in the West, something new, but in India, over. Uh, 2,600 years already developed the quantum physics, the concept of quantum physics already there. It is true. So when we discuss with quantum physicists, you see, mm, it seems, you see, we have better knowledge than the scientists. <laughs> One thing. Then, then the psychology. As far as the psychology is concerned, I think Buddhist psychology highly advanced. advanced. I usually describe Indian psychology, ancient Indian psychology. Buddha, Buddha himself, product of ancient Indian tradition. So, uh, Indian psychology, I think, start, I think, more than 3,000 years. So, therefore, uh, psychology is concerned, knowledge about the mind is concerned, you see, the m many scientists, you see, they really uh, very, very eager to learn from our knowledge, like that. Then the, the, the till uh, the late 20th century, it's a scientist, only brain, beside brain, nothing. Uh, now, gradually, uh, because you see, they experiment, Peop some people who really have uh, sort of deeper experience through meditation, then gr they, through training mind or meditation, effect their brain. On the brain, yeah. Oh, because Effect on the brain. Plus, yeah. Uh, particularly on the explained in terms of uh, neuroplasticity, brain plasticity. So therefore, now some uh, brain specialist now they begin to accept there is another factor which affects our brain. So that we call consciousness, consciousness like that. So, so like that. And when I. Or say they start dialogue with scientists about 40 years ago. They say, I express my desire to some of my friend, one Westerner, who follow Tibetan Buddhism. Then some of them warned me, be careful. Science is killer of religious faith. So therefore, be careful. Then I start with it, sort of the or say the ka. No, no, with the sort of Buddhist teaching, uh, all my followers should not accept my teaching out of faith, but rather thorough investigation 
and experiment. So therefore, I thought, no problem. Then I start. So now, eventually, I think the scientific knowledge not much effect sort of Buddhist knowledge, knowledge or Buddhist faith. Uh, I think the Buddhist tradition some effect to scientific the scientist mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, we're uh, unfortunately being told our time is up. Uh, I could do this forever and ever and ever. Uh, but His Holiness has given us, I think, almost half an hour of his very precious time, which we thank him for. Uh, there's so much more to talk about. Um, I would ask everyone here to please remember the people inside of Tibet and yes. how yes. difficult their lives are right now. Yes. Um, please think about them. Please see if there's some way that you can help them. The International Campaign for Tibet is a vehicle that you can trust that will help them inside and outside of Tibet. So please keep those Tibetans in your thoughts and in your hearts. And Your Holiness, thank you so very, very, very much. I know you're about to start your public talk. Tarve. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's all one talk to His Holiness. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Um, so, good morning, everybody. Does it work? Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Matteo Mekacci. I'm the president of the International Company for Tibet. And here is Jan Anderson, who's the chairman of ICT Europe and a longtime supporter of the Tibetan people. Thank you, Your Holiness. Thank you, Richard. The International Campaign for Tibet on the occasion of our 30th anniversary, is honored to offer a grant of $50,000 towards the promotion of Your Holiness' core message of the importance of secular ethics, which is a great inspiration and service to humanity. ICT will make... Thank you. Thank you. Okay. ICT will make this grant to the Dalai Lama Institute for Higher Education, which is based in Bangalore, in India. The fund will be specifically allocated towards the Institute's special curriculum on secular ethics, aiming to educate future Tibetan generations in these universal moral values. This offering is in recognition of Your Holiness' lifelong dedication to peace and nonviolence, your consistent efforts to promote secular ethics, the dynamic leadership which you have provided to the Tibetan people, and which is an inspiration to the international community. Your Holiness, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your wisdom and compassion, which are a strong motivational force for all of us in cultivating such an attitude towards a better future for all. The International Campaign for Tibet, Rotterdam, September 16, 2018. Thank you. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Could you say? Could you say? Thank you. My name is Krista Meindersma. As board member of ICT, I very much like to thank His Holiness for being present during this ICT event today. I remember very vividly, 30 years ago, I was in Tibet. And what struck me most about the Tibetans is their commitment 
to nonviolence and their determination to preserve their culture, their language, and their religion. And of course, their unwavering love for His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And some of us, individuals from all over the world, met in Tibet and we became friends. And we were convinced at that time that if enough information about the situation in Tibet reached the outside world, the issue would be resolved peacefully through dialogue and His Holiness would be able to return home. Now, 30 years later, at the core of ICT's work is really to bring out the facts about the situation in Tibet. So if you feel inspired by this beautiful conversation and by everything you see and hear today, please join this movement, become engaged, become active, and do your part to preserve this beautiful culture, language, religion of Tibet, and environment, of course. With this, I would like to end this ICT event, and it is my great honor and pleasure to invite His Holiness to now give his public talk on why compassion is necessary in our troubled world. Thank you. <laughs>